You're listening to the Capital Press Room and we're turning our attention to the use of non-compete agreements in the workplace, which are the subject of legislation introduced by State Senator Sean Ryan, a Buffalo Democrat who chairs the Chamber's Committee on Commerce, Economic Development and Small Business. And he joins us to talk about his proposal. Welcome back to the show, Senator. Great to be here today. Thank you. And also with us is Pat Garofalo, Director of State and Local Policy at the American Economic Liberties Project, which champions anti-monopoly policies. Welcome to the program, Pat. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's our pleasure. So before we get into your legislation, Senator, I'm hoping you can talk about what a non-compete agreement can consist of generally and and how they're used, broadly speaking. We probably have a concept of a non-compete is a top-level executive might have to sign a non-compete or a scientist with a white lab coat you're working on on trade secrets. But that idea has, has really morphed, and more and more average employees are being asked to sign non-competes, which means you, know, you can't work in a, a similar field, often within a certain geography. And it went from being very specific you know, to executive and scientists now almost 20% of the workforce is being asked to sign a non-compete agreement. Well, yeah, Pat, can you elaborate a little bit on the different forms that non-compete agreements can take, as well as the the different types of jobs that are now covered by these in many instances, including in New York? Absolutely. Yeah, the senator is exactly right that these have come way down the sort of income and prestige scale uh, to affect tons of everyday workers in fast food, in nail salons, in janitorial services, um, and often now very notoriously in the healthcare field, nurses, doctors, all are forced to sign these non-competes, meaning they can't take a job with a competitor, usually within a certain geographic distance for a set amount of time. And sometimes those lengths of time are five, six, seven years. This really locks workers in place and therefore locks down their ability to bargain for better wages. That's one of the best ways to get your wages up is to go take a better paying job or to tell your employer you're thinking about taking a better paying job and and getting a raise that way. And this really prevents that from happening. So it really harms workers. The Federal Trade Commission estimates that wages would be nearly $300 billion higher in the U.S. were non-competes banned across the board. Well, Senator, you've introduced legislation to essentially ban non-compete agreements in New York. Why is that the right response to this problem as opposed to letting the marketplace work it out? The marketplace just becomes very unfair to the employees. You know, you sometimes hear, David, that well, non-competes don't matter because maybe they're not even enforceable in New York. They might be enforceable. They might not be enforceable. But there's a complicated four-point test. So in order for an employee to test whether or not their non-compete is going to be binding on them, they have to go to a lawyer, pay money to figure out if they could get out of the place that they currently work. And that's a hurdle that most employees just just can't jump over. It's too much for them. And would your legislation then apply just to prospective non-compete agreements moving forward? Or would this have an impact on the non-compete agreements that are currently in place for employees and employers? This bill would invalidate uh, all existing non-compete agreements and ban their future use. So if you're currently working under a non-compete, that would become invalid. Well, why would it be fair then to essentially uproot the current uh, arrangements that people have entered into? You know, basically, it's bad public policy because it's it's bad for our our economy. Uh, It makes it so workers are are stuck in their jobs, leads to wage suppression. It prevents people from opening businesses, stifles competition. And generally, it's a bad economic policy. It limits the pools of employees who are qualified to be job applicants, but they can't go to the next job. So you hear employers say all the time, I I can't get people in the front door. Often the reason they can't get people in the front door to apply is because the people have signed non-compete agreements. And I give you an example of just how prevalent they are. I rented a car last summer uh, from a national uh, car dealer. And I uh, I asked the guy at the counter, a young guy, do you you have a non-compete? And he said, I don't even know what you're talking about. But when I went to return the car a few days later, the same guy was there. And he said, no, I looked in my paperwork. He goes, I do have a non-compete. And he said to me, 
Does that mean I can't go work at the other national chain across the street if they offer me more money? And I said, that's kind of kind of what it means. Um, and I think it's shocking to most employees often to know that they even have a non-compete. Well, Pat, the scenario that the senator laid out is obviously pretty underhanded by the company. But what about situations where employers are upfront about requiring a non-compete and an employee is going into that situation with their eyes open? Why shouldn't two willing parties be allowed to enter into a non-compete agreement? Because there are still power dynamics at play that can make it very difficult for that worker to say no to the non-compete. And that's even leaving aside right, what the senator pointed out, that this is sort of bad policy generally and harms economic growth, harms small business creation. But there's still a power imbalance between employers and prospective employees that oftentimes will lead them to sign the non-compete, even though they know it's a bad idea, they know it's going to harm them in their future career because they need the job and they need the money right then and right now. And, and an across the board and retroactive ban is directly in line with what's been proposed at the federal level by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, it's really important for states to come backfill that because they have a lot of states have a lot of jurisdiction that the FTC doesn't. But this is very much in line with what's been going on uh, at the federal level. And one more point that I think is really important to make is that non-competes are currently invalid in three states, North Dakota, California, and Oklahoma, and they have been since the 1890s. I did not say that incorrectly. More than a century of non-competes being invalid in those states. And when we think of California, right, we think of a lot of innovation and a lot of big, important companies. The economy there hasn't been harmed. I would argue it's even been helped by them not having uh, the ability to enforce non-competes. Are there any situations in which it does make sense to limit a employee's movement from one job to another based on information they might have gleaned from an employer about the way they do their business or about the landscape uh, more broadly, Pat? So you can achieve those goals, which I agree are completely valid, without resorting to the blunt instrument of a non-compete. You can use other agreements, such as a non-disclosure agreement or such as a non-solicitation agreement, the latter of which basically means that someone won't go and try poach customers from their current firm. So you can achieve those same ends without resorting to the really broad, blunt effect of a non-compete. And in fact, the FTC went and looked for any evidence that non-compete agreements protect trade secrets or block the kind of misappropriation of company information, and they didn't find any because it doesn't exist. Well, you talked about a power dynamic, Pat. Are there certain positions, though, like company CEO, for example, where a employee is in a position to enter into a non-compete agreement, or do you think the problem really is up and down the employment ladder? I think it's across the board, even with a CEO and, you know, the way they're hired is kind of funky and different. But even then, you can achieve what you want to achieve without using a non-compete. But the folks we're most concerned with are the ones who are in a, in a severe power imbalance. But some of those people are often very well compensated. You think about a doctor who is someone we think of that, you know, makes a ton of money, has a lot of power. A lot of doctors are really bound by non-competes and can't move around and can't serve their patients. And I, you know, I keep mentioning the FTC's rulemaking on this. They solicited comments from the public. So I went through and looked for comments from New Yorkers that were submitted to the FTC. And I pulled up one that I want to just read quick because it, it really struck me. He says, I am an MD. It has been directly affected by non-competes. I have no ability to practice within 60 miles of where I live as my non-compete is not bound by mileage, but by competing health systems, which have monopolized medical care in Long Island and New York. I have no authority to leave my employer unless I move my entire family out of state. And that's what we're talking about. This, you know, the power imbalance ties into the fact that the economy has gotten more monopolized. There's been more concentration. There are fewer employers. So you get in these areas where there are only one, two, maybe three large employers, and you get a situation where a doctor would have to move 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 miles to get a new job. I'll give you a consumer side of that same story. My wife's treating physician recently went to a, a new practice group. And uh, when my wife was finally able to contact her, his treating physician was, was over 20 miles away. And, you know, she asked, why did you move your office way the heck out here? And the answer was, because uh, I had an agreement saying I couldn't practice within this practice group's area for uh, a period uh, of years. So that meant 
my wife as a consumer then had to travel 20 some miles in order to keep the continuity of care. So, you know, that's a great example of how it's bad for the employee, but it's also bad on the consumer side. Well, Senator, any sympathy for the idea that employers right now might have a hard time recruiting employees, so there's a vested interest in wanting to retain your talent, and that's one of the reasons they might utilize non-compete agreements. And if there was another company that wanted to poach someone, why not making them buy out that employee in some meaningful way so that the employer doesn't get too hurt by having to replace uh, some valuable asset at their business. That's just how the economy works, right? If if your employee wants to go work for somebody else and that person thinks they're qualified and valuable and wants to pay them more, then you you move jobs. But the idea is that we're going to restrict the entire economy uh, by making it so employees can't go to new jobs. That also gives a, a really disincentive for that employer to either raise wages or to improve working conditions. So, you know, by and large, you know, we believe in the, the free market and letting the economy sort of go where it's going to go. And these types of adhesion contracts is sort of a take it or leave it when you get hired. They're just not good for the overall economy. It creates what people call a clog in the economy. You know, you want the economy to run smoothly and suddenly you want to onboard somebody and you realize you have to pump the brakes because they have you know, a, a non-compete agreement. So it doesn't allow the you know, the free flow of, of employees, company X to company Y. Um, it, it's just not good for the economy. I think that's a really important point. And I was struck by, it was a few days after the FTC proposed its ban at the federal level. And there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about the way that employers were reacting and thinking about how they were going to retain employees. And they had these wacky, wild ideas like, increasing pay, giving out bonuses, giving longer vacation time. And that's what we want, right? You want to flip the script so that employers feel the need to provide more to employees in order to keep them around rather than taking the pressure off of them through a non-compete. We've been trying to ask New Yorkers if they've been affected by this and how. And we set up a website, uh, non-compete at seanryansenate.com. And one of the examples of people who answered was somebody who was in a, uh, the healthcare field who was laid off from their job and the employer enforced the non-compete against them after laying them off. So they couldn't work in that whole area of Northern New York for three years after they were laid off from their job. That's not the outcome we're looking for. Well, finally, Senator, this bill has been kicking around since uh, 2021 and has yet to move through the committee process. So I'm curious what reaction you're getting from your colleagues about this issue so far, uh, considering there hasn't been much public appetite to move the bill. What seems to be the holdup at this point? I think since we introduced this bill, the thought about non-competes has really shifted. Um, At at first, it was a head-scratching idea, and people talked about trade secrets and is it good or or bad. Uh, But since then, the federal government uh, has really come on board and has shed light on the fact that it's just really bad for the entire national economy, these non-competes, and then we have to really reel them in. Uh, We're doing a Senate hearing on this on May 23rd. We're going to hear more from experts, but also people who have been, been affected by it. So you know, we want to keep good economic conditions uh, in New York State. We're going to protect companies' uh, non-disclosure. We're going to make sure that you know there's not stealing of, of secrets. But we're also going to make it so employees can travel uh, from job to job without being restrained uh, by unnecessary uh, uh, contracts. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we've been speaking with State Senator Sean Ryan. He is a Buffalo Democrat. Senator, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you very much, David. And we've also been hearing from Pat Garofalo, Director of State and Local Policy at the American Economic Liberties Project. Thank you so much, Pat. Thanks for having me. Is your business, agency, or service interested in delivering your message to more than two dozen radio stations statewide carrying Capital Press Room? If so, visit capitalpressroom.org to contact our underwriting team.